Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is good. All the time. I want to encourage you, every one of you, to be especially welcoming in the next 30 minutes, no, 15, about 15 minutes or so, when the rest of the congregation shows up. Uh, please just act like it was just normal. In here to I had a lot of encouraging comments uh, before I came in here today about how I should handle the reality that we would have lower numbers because of the snow and the time change and everything. Uh, someone actually suggested that I ought to preach, my sermon life ought to be directly related to the number of people that are here. So the more men, people who are in the sanctuary, I should preach a longer sermon, the less people I should preach a shorter one. What do you think of that idea? <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. We have it. So, someone said, uh, we, are not a, we are a fair weather uh, congregation. And I said, no, we're not. Because when it's fair weather, everybody goes out on the water and plays golf. We're more tempered. Temperate kind of congregation. As long as the weather's not really great, not really bad, we would really show up in numbers. Well, we're grateful that you were all here. Uh, I, I almost, uh, I told the choir that I thought for the first time in the history of this church, the choir members actually outnumbered the congregation, but how I'm doing the math, you're slightly ahead still, so keep it up. <laughs> Unless you switch teams. Today we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Psalms. Psalms is one of the most wonderful collection of uh, uh, scriptures uh, to share in multiple times in your life. When there are good times, there are difficult times, whenever we are struggling in life, whenever we are trying to give direction and understand what it is that God would have us do, I very often open up the book of Psalms and that's the place I go. You can literally just do one of those things where you kind of take the book of Psalms and put your thumbs on either end and then just kind of flip it open to anything and you will find something in there that inspires, encourages, challenges, chastens. Uh, and brings you uh, to an understanding or a better understanding about how we have our relationship with God. And today's no different. I want to turn your attention, if you would, take out your few Bibles, your personal ones, and turn to Psalm 37. We're going to be reading the first 11 verses, and then we're going to jump over to verse 39 and read the last two verses, 39 and 40. So, if you would uh, join me, Psalm 30, 37, verses 1 and following. Listen for the word of Almighty God today. The psalmist writes this. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, uh, yet a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. And finally, verse 39 and 40. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Would you pray with me now? Gracious God of love and mercy, we give you thanks for the power of the words that we have just shared, the admonishment and the encouragement to be faithful and to trust in you. We pray today, Lord God, that that spirit may prevail upon each one of us, that your spirit may so infuse us that our hearts and our minds might be open to the ways in which you would speak to us as each may have need to hear it. Take these words, we pray, Lord God, and join them together with the words that shall follow, that they may be that one word that each of us has need to hear. And in that spirit, I pray 
as I always do, that you would give me the gift of preaching and those here gathered ears to hear it and hearts to make it real. For we ask this ever and always in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Long before Peggy and I became true North Carolinians, about 40 years ago, after we had gotten married, we spent a little time, we started to uh, do this on a regular basis. We would travel down to her parents' farm in Old Fort, North Carolina, which is in the western part of the state. It's on the other side of Black Mountain, and it is near Asheville, and it's an absolutely beautiful place. It's actually not directly in Old Fort. It's, it's up in, into the valley there, a crooked creek, and it's the most remarkable and beautiful place you'd ever want to see. The farm sat back on a hillside that overlooked the mountains that were across the fields and the pastures and the road that was there, and then on up to the hill. And you can imagine and see history literally kind of played out in the ways that men and women used to live there and work there and farm the land that was there. These are hard-working people who lived in that area, and we became uh, absolutely enamored with the folks who lived there. Uh, we would often find it difficult to find our way back to the place every time we would leave, and whenever we had to have somebody come out to do some service, perhaps on the furnace or some other part about the farm or one of the buildings that were there while we were visiting, we often found it difficult to give directions because we didn't quite understand how to do directions uh, in, in, uh, in those days, and in, particularly in a rural environment like that, where they would often tell us how to get to places by telling us to go down the road until we get to the place where the old oak tree used to be, and then make a left. Well, uh, the house, the, the farm, had been purchased by a guy by the name of Wilbur Gillum, and Wilbur was a very, well, let me just be blunt, he was the cheapest guy you've ever met. But he believed in, in working the land hard and, and uh, never put a bit of, of commercial fertilizer on the ground. He constantly tilled that land and took care of that land and nurtured that place, but he was a, he was a, all right, he was cheap. And so when the day came when he had to paint the barn, he had some whitewash and he had a huge pile of strawberries and he decided he was gonna mix the strawberries into the whitewash paint the barn, and from that point on, for many, many, for about 20 years, uh, we were known as the, the farm that had the pink barn. <laughs> and so if you ever needed to send somebody to find a place, you would just tell them, go find the pink barn. That's how stringent and careful was this man who was a deeply faithful man of God. But we loved the area, we would travel around, and some of the things that we found were fascinating. People were always just incredible. Uh, when you're in an, a rural environment and you don't have a lot of resources around you, you have, to, you have to depend upon your neighbor, you have to depend upon yourself, but most importantly, if you're really going to prosper, you need to depend on God. And so as we were traveling around one time, near Asheville, on the north end there, uh, near the Smoky Mountain National Park, and the Pisgah National Forest that's right there, Highway 209 cuts through. How many of you have ever been on that road? I'm sure you have. You've driven on that road on 209, and as you're driving up there, we were just enamored of all the cute and, uh, and amazing little places we found. These tiny little birds, these little kind of, not towns really, not incorporated like our town here, but, but you see these little gatherings of people who lived in these little clutches in particular places. And we found these two places on the road about a mile apart that absolutely really got me to thinking. And it came back to me many years later when I read something about the two towns. These towns were uh, at about the same size exactly, about one mile apart, one on the north side of 209, one on the south side of 209. The one on the north side of 209 seemed to be doing pretty well. I mean, all the houses were very simple and basic, but the houses uh, north of 209 in this little tiny village or this little tiny town that was there were all very well kept. They weren't palatial in any way, shape, or form. They weren't magnificent. They, but they were well manicured, and the yards were cut, and the fields were, were uh, full of, uh, uh, of good uh, things growing there in those fields, and it just kind of looked lush and good. But when you went to the south side of the town, to the other little, little place that was over there, the place, same kind of houses, but they all looked run down. The fields were overrun with weeds and other things. Cars were up on blocks. 
in their yards, and, and it just, just didn't look that good. And what was amazing to me was the contrast between the two. A mile apart, and the one little, little bird was doing exceptionally well, and the one in the south was doing poorly. And what really kind of struck me when I thought about those two places, and they still exist today, by the way, and pretty much from what I understand in the same condition, is it all came down to the names that they had named their towns. You see, the town to the north on 209 was called Trust, and the town to the south is called Luck. I'm not making that up. Go ahead and Google it. If you have a phone right now, I give you permission to pull it out and Google it. You will find that one town is called Trust and the other is called Luck. And they each reflected the name, almost as if the philosophy that was in the name reflected the kind of result that ultimately came about in that community. And it's the kind of thing that in the Psalms, as we read through the Psalm today, that we see reflected in there, the, the admonition to take seriously what it means to follow God's will and the benefits that come from it. And to not get ourselves caught up in thinking about the way the world works and the kinds of things that the world values. Because if we do, we ultimately find destruction comes in it and bounty comes in the other. And so I want you to think back, if you would, with me to the experience of, the, of uh, David as he was writing these psalms and the, and the environment in which he found himself living. Now there was a group of people in that point in time who were very faithful to God. They trusted God. They believed in God. They lived their lives trying to seek to keep the values that God had put before them as had been expressed through the generations that had preceded them. And yet there were other people who were also uh, people who were a part of them, a family, if you will, an extended family, who had chosen to live a different life. You might say that they actually lived their lives based on luck. And when I say luck, I don't mean luck in the sense that they spent their time gambling in the ways that we would think of, of, of gambling in our context today. But in a sense, separating themselves from the power of having God in your life and suffering the consequences that came from it. And yet in that point in time in which we read this psalm, what we discover very quickly is that clearly the psalmist who is speaking to the people who were there, who are trying to be faithful, have been observing the bounty that the people who have not been trusting God have been experiencing. By living their lives as freely and as openly as they wanted, doing whatever they wanted to do, they, they had prospered. Now, I know many of you have experienced this yourself. You've seen other people who have lived their lives in ways that you would consider to be not necessarily uh, a reflection of God's will, and yet they seem to prosper. It's one of the fundamental questions that we ask in our theology. One is, why does evil exist at all? If God is good, why is there evil? That's one question we ask. Another question is, why do good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people? People who are trying to be faithful. And these are struggling questions that constantly roll through our minds and our hearts. And we wonder to ourselves why it is that these things happen the way they do. And what we discover very often when we look at the lives of people who have lived their lives separate and apart from God is that they, they tend to do pretty well. And they often do well because they're doing things uh, to skirt the edges, to, to bend the rules, to break the processes that God has intended uh, for his people. And the psalmist recognized that. And so the very first verse, the very first verse in that passage that I read to you in Psalm 37 reads this. Listen closely. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. Envious of wrongdoers. That's a challenging thing. When you and I admit to ourselves that in many parts of our lives we're really honest with ourselves, we want to do well, we want to prosper, we want to be important, we want to be successful, we want to have all of the kinds of things that the world values. We may say out loud, I scoff at all of that, but internally, secretly, we very often find ourselves envious of those who are doing better. How many of you have ever been blessed with, you're blessed with a wonderful home in which you live and yet you spend time flipping through real estate magazines looking at how the other half lives? You ever done that? Yeah. You're driving a nice car. It's comfortable. It's safe. It's secure. And all you can think about is, man, that guy in that other car over there, he's really doing well. Right? 
if you think of a host of other things that fit that same bill, and it's a natural part of our human existence, and kind of a part of who we are as human beings, that we desire the things that we think are valuable because they are shiny and bright. It's almost as if we all have ADD, you know? You see the bright, shiny thing, the object moving, and suddenly our attention is drawn to it, and we start to think to ourselves, my, if only I had this, if only I had that, if only I were like this, if only I were like that. And this is the deadly, this kind of thinking that exists in all the world for the men and women who seek to be faithful. For it always and continually undermines who we are. You take the pages of scripture and you open them from the very first pages that describe the conditions of Adam and Eve and go all the way through to the book of Revelation. You will discover in each section, in each part, examples of the comparison the comparison and contrasting of these two kinds of worldviews, these philosophies, if you will. Living your life trusting God or living your life trusting in luck. And you see ultimately what comes from it again and again and again. I remember back in the 70s, there was a story about a fellow by the name of Eli M. Black. Eli M. Black was the Warren Buffett of his day. Okay? This guy was the kind of guy who was absolutely, unbelievably successful in investments. He became a, a big CEO of a very large investment company. He was a, a, one of the signs of Wall Street. He was respected by everybody. He just made money like, you know, he just kind of, he was one of those guys who would walk by a bank and it's like the money would just kind of flow into his pocket, you know what I'm saying? It just seemed like everything would go his way. <coughs> and everybody would, were, and was envious of this man and how successful he had been. And he literally had billions of dollars from where people had billions and billions of dollars. Now it seems like it almost everybody has billions of dollars. I mean, I, do you have billions of dollars? I know, but I keep reading about it. All these people have billions of dollars. And when I'm sitting in my nice, comfortable house and we're begging and I are watching those real estate shows and I see these people who are buying these million-dollar houses, and I'm thinking, how do they afford to buy million-dollar houses? And, you know, and, and be just like like everybody else in those situations, right? And everybody was envious of black. Until one day, in February of 1975, word came to him that he was just about to be indicted. Listen to this. For paying a $2.5 million bribe to the president of Honduras so that he would have lower taxes on the export of bananas. <coughs> the jig, as they say, was up. Now a faithful person who had gotten astray, who had wandered off on a path that wasn't healthy and right, just might turn to the book uh, that we read right here and see in that the indictment of the heart that we find reflected in that song, we might ask themselves, what should I do in response? How should I respond to the situation that I now have found myself in? Should I let go of my greedy and, and, and desirous ways and, and trust God to get me through it and to live a different life that reflects God's values? Or will I keep living off of luck? No. Lack's decision was neither. What he ultimately did when he got word from his attorney that he was about to be indicted, he picked up his briefcase, he walked to the window of his 44th floor office in the Pan Am building in New York, and he kicked out the window pane, and he stepped out and fell those 44 floors to his death. All because he had built his life addicted to living a life of luck depending on some resources, manipulating and shifting the world's values to feed himself in his need. Now, not everybody responds that way, and not everybody gets as wealthy as that man does, but there are plenty of times and plenty of examples where men and women find themselves in this situation, in which the situation calls for them to do one or two things, to live their lives trusting God, how to put their faith in happenstance, their own efforts, manipulating the world, hoping to figure out a better angle, to get the odds in their favor. And the difference between the two 
is stark and clear according to the scriptures. And frankly, I think in the lives of men and women who have to decide whether they're going to live faithfully to follow Jesus Christ and his world values or the values of the world. Now you may follow the values of the world, you may take your chances, you may be addicted to the, to the benefits and the rush that comes from taking risks, and you may be fine, or you may fail, or you may end your life at the end of it, having lived a long and fruitful life, never having had the consequences that come for it until the very end, and you know what those consequences are. Or you choose instead to live God's values in His way and to enjoy the benefits that come from it. And it may not be the biggest house or the fastest car or the fullest refrigerator or the nicest clothing or the highest social standing or whatever other thing you may think the world thinks is important. But you will have instead men and women of faith who are your friends and family who loves and cares for you as you love and care for them. And grace and peace in your life. And the gift of forgiveness to be able to do the thing that you cannot do yourself under your own power, but to love somebody who has wronged you in spite of what they have done. To care for them, even though they have hurt you. And to let go of the pain. And to let go of the wrong. And to embrace and to care for the other. The life choices between these two are dramatic and wonderful. And yet, and yet, we human beings are so tempted to be in charge of our own lives, so willing to risk luck in how we live our lives. I'll give you this little story about this artwork that was done. I can't remember the name of the artist, but it was done about 10 or 15 years ago. It's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of things are called art today that personally I don't think are necessarily art. But I'm not an art expert, so I guess I don't qualify as the guy who gets to decide that. But the thing that this artist had created was a chair. And with the chair was a device that was connected to it that held up in front of the chair a shotgun. A shotgun. Have you heard about this? A shotgun. And the shotgun's barrel was pointed directly at the chair. And the artwork required that for you to really appreciate this, your, your job was to go in there and, and, and to sit in the chair and to stare down the barrel of the shotgun. Now here's the twist, you ready for this? The twist was the artist had created, I mean if you were just looking down the barrel of a shotgun, you could sit in your own house and do that, right? I mean that's not art. But this is special because this was an experience, this was experiential art. And the idea was that you would sit in a chair, stand on the barrel, and the, the barrel of the gun somehow had been rigged in some way with a timer that had a 100-year timer in it. And somewhere along the line, between zero, the first moment it was set up, and 100 years, this gun was designed to go off. Every time you'd sit down in the chair, it would activate the thing, and if your time came, bang, gun would go off. And here's the amazing thing. You ready for this? When they put that in, I think it was in Cleveland, at the museum in Cleveland. I don't think I'm ever going to a museum in Cleveland. It sounds really dangerous. People literally lined up around the block to take their turn sitting in the chair and staring down the barrel. Now I ask you, as a rational person, do you think that makes sense? <laughs> of course not. Because we're sitting here and we're thinking, that's insane. That's crazy. How would anybody do something like that? But the fact remains that there are many, many people who do the very same thing when it comes to living their lives apart from God. And every day they wake up and they make the choice to ignore God and God's values and instead have themselves at the center of the universe. Make themselves the most important thing their own desires, their own wishes, they are sitting in a chair, staring on the barrel of a shotgun, waiting to go off. They don't know, and you don't know, and none of us know when that, that, that trigger is going to be triggered. But one day it will. 
But the better part of hell is to choose a different path. A life that's built on something of substance and of genuine and true meaning. And that's trusting God. Living with men and women of faith. <clears throat> Living by God's kingdom values. Caring about something other than just yourself. And remembering always that when God is with you in the midst of it, your, your pantry may be full, your pantry may be bare, but in all of it, God will be present with you in it. And he will love you and give you the strength to love one another, and to nurture one another, and to care for one another, and have eyes to see the broken, and the weak, and the hurt, and to care for them too, and to be the hands that reach out and touch them and change them, and bring them close into the embrace of God's love. That's the challenge we have. Will we live our lives trusting God or addicted to luck? The choice is always up to you. Let us pray. Father God, so much of our life, we live without purpose. We simply bounce back and forth from thing to thing, oblivious to the greater purposes and good that can be found in trusting and believing in you. Help us to humble our hearts, to open ourselves, especially in this season of Lent, to your direction, to your wisdom, to your values. And as we go about the business of living our lives, we may do so trusting and believing in you above all other things. And then, Lord God, we pray simply this, that in that humility and in that grace, we may truly find the wonders that come from following you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
believe through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life for everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Now let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for our lives, and for one another. We give you thanks for this very moment when we can gather together to share space and hearts, to worship you, and to find warmth for our bodies and our souls within these walls. Lord, we lift our petitions to you. We pray for our nation and its leaders. Give them and us a vision of the kind of world you envision, the one announced by Jesus. Guide lawmakers to make laws that are just. Guide leaders throughout the world when hard decisions are at hand and people's lives are at stake. Lord, we lift up to you those on our prayer list and in our hearts who are challenged by illness, or chronic conditions and pain, that you give them strength and bring healing. We pray that you would comfort all who have experienced loss. Lift the spirits of those who are discouraged or diminished, that they may reclaim hope and be inspired to use their gifts for your service. We are thankful, Lord, for your comforting presence during times that try our faith. Help all of us to hear the good news that transforms light out of darkness so that we may grow in our confidence and trust in you. All of this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now we have the opportunity to give back to God through our tithes and offerings. <clears throat> <clears throat> 